Hi. Uh, earlier, I didn't embarrass uh, Kevin from RTE, but I thought when he was going on about the BBC being an RTE being some guardians of objectivity, it was a bit of a joke. And I thought back to the Nice Treaty period where Declan Ganley was getting the whole of the media establishment, the political establishment against him. It was pretty disgraceful behaviour. And fortunately, you know, the Irish public took his side on that, so they saw through it. Um, my question to Gabriel is, isn't it the case that the conservative critics are right? The, the broadsheet media in the States is overwhelmingly liberal. Um, the, the research shows that most journalists see themselves as liberal Democrats. And uh, the conservative response is not irrational in that sense. Well, I think that's, so let me take your question in, in two parts. So yes, the conservative view, your, your question is valid, that the conservative view is that the major establishment media organizations in the United States are predominantly staffed and run uh, by what they would consider, quote, liberals. Now, I think that this raises a separate question that that critique fails to uh, account for, which is that as a journalist, can you approach your profession as a craft? Is there an, a notion of a, quote, professional code that governs how you approach and report a story that transcends politics? I mean, I'm just taking myself for an example because I can only speak for my own work. When I approach a story, I go for, quote, the story. My job is to try to talk to everybody. And at the end of all of that reporting, uh, my, my, my view and my, my sort of sense of the story is refined by the rigorous uh, uh, interviews I've done leading up to that. So that whole critique is premised on this idea that I go into a story with a certain preconceived notion. Yes, I, I, I think this way about the world, therefore, you know, don't even do any reporting. Just, just sit down and write it before you begin. I, I, I think that's a, that's a fallacy that has, that has existed on the right that to critique the establishment media organizations in the United States that is very persuasive to their audience and, and, and you know, people who love Fox News and watch Fox News, I get emails regularly from people who, you know, denounce me as some, you know, leftist Marxist, you know, agent plant to, you know, destroy Fox News, which couldn't be further from the truth. It's, it's, it's a persuasive argument that they like to believe, but I do believe, just speaking from my own personal experience, that it is possible to approach a story in a way that completely transcends politics or your own personal experience just by following the, the, the codes and the standards of the craft of reporting, which is go out and you ask the basic questions and you constantly are back testing your own assumptions, you're getting contradictory points of views, you're always being skeptical uh, of, of your premises and at the end of all, of all of your reporting, you have a sort of a sense of what the story is. Now you may have sort of certain nuances that that you could always get more depth on. But I, I, I don't agree with that, that this idea that just because the conservatives believe the media is liberal, therefore its, its agenda is to help Democrats. That's just, that's not true. I just, I don't, I don't know any reporter personally who gets up every morning saying, my job is to help uh, liberal politicians because I'm a liberal. I just, that, and if maybe that exists, I just haven't come across it. Yeah, David, you I, I was just going to say that I, I, I would have some sympathy for, for your view there, and it, it was interesting you mentioned Declan Ganley um, and Nice, and, and actually in Nice too, I think a lot of them had learned to lesson, which um, I, it was Simon Jenkins, uh, Amanda's, uh, well, well, the editor of The Guardian, who I think said that, uh, that the, the only guarantee of media freedom ultimately is plurality. Um, and uh, you know, you need different outlets. You can't ever regulate that one outlet will be perfectly balanced. And, and it's great, you know, in the US, you do have the different views and you do have different opinions. And it's interesting what's going to happen as to you say to all the right wing media. But the big issue here, for example, let's take something like the economic crisis, which is, uh, is absolutely put down to the banks. And I'm sure, I'm sure the banks did dreadful things. I'm sure they're all wrong. I'm sure they did awful things in that. But the level of, of, uh, of commentary that is heaped on the banks is so much greater than on the public service. Um, and public servants have a difficult job to do and they've all of that, but nonetheless, it's just an interesting issue. Is there, is there really a balance? And I'm not saying that's been misreported. I'm saying the only way you can really get a balance is if you have a number of outlets. Now, actually where you get it much more is in the newspaper 
uh, uh, media. And, um, but the issue then is you get that slight <laughs> exchange of views and is there, is there a bit of groupthink, is there a bit of condition around the major issues? I, I don't know. Would you, would you like to see, uh, I suppose in, given the regulatory environment in Ireland or in the United Kingdom, would you like to see a situation whereby you could run a Fox News type network here? Um, I'd certainly, I, I think I'd certainly like the freedom to, I'd like Fox News resources, um, but I'd like the... No, uh, in terms of editorial, would you like... Uh, editorial, yeah, I would like the idea that I, I would certainly, look, I think when it comes to editorial, I'm not sure that, you know, we've a regulated broadcast authority of Ireland. I think they take a fairly benign view. I think they are trying to be as relaxed as possible around the regulation. Um, consequently, uh, our late night current affairs is probably slightly more opinionated than, than, than some of the regulation might have envisaged. I would certainly love to see the opportunity for that to go in a, in a different direction as well. We need, we need good right-wing commentary, we need good left-wing commentary. Um, I think it's very difficult to find good, good guaranteed neutral commentary. Um, so yeah, I think I would like to be able to see that. Amanda, did you? Yeah, actually, I just wanted to um, drop in a little analysis um, about this from Jay Rosen. I pulled up the piece when I was listening. And to your point, he said, um, the United States is a conservative country the most journalists are liberals, and he's talking about a criticism of media generally. Even though they will claim to practice neutrality, they weave their ideology into their reporting and people sense this bias. The result is mistrust. The problem has gotten worse since 1976. What else do you need to know? Well, one thing I'd like to know is how come Fox News, dedicated to eradicating liberal bias, is simultaneously the most mistrusted and the most trusted news source, according to survey research in the United States. That suggests it's a little bit more complicated than this conservative country, liberal bias. Um, and I think that's a, sort of an interesting nugget to throw your way because I think it is very easy to draw that quick and fast line between well, the, the two, point, the but last, it is a much. The last point is quite simple. People like to have their prejudice uh, reconfirmed by the media choices. And as Stuart mentioned earlier, actually, the research shows that China TV globally is the most trusted news channel, which shows that you know, some people. Right, but also to to his point, he was he was, I think he was suggesting that um, trust exists in different forms. That people might look at that as trusting it as being the voice of the government and seeing it as an accurate representation of that voice. That's a, that's a different argument than the trust you're speaking of. Just, just before we go to Henry Silk, I know you want to ask us, Stuart. Do you want to get in on that as a former as a former yeah, regulator? I think, I think that's, uh, do you want to take the mic there just for a second? Okay, I, I, I do believe that it might be possible to relax the rules on impartiality a little, but I have to say, of the same conversations I've had with politicians on this, and there aren't many, I have to say, because <laughs> it's a subject in which they think in absolutely knee-jerk terms, the most reasonable point they make is, what would you actually do during elections? And actually, that is not easily solved. But then, put alongside that, I mentioned this conference I was at last week, the head of Netflix was at the conference, and it was put to him, you know, Netflix is becoming more and more popular, delivering new content. It happens to be drama, but it actually could be news and current affairs, and it's delivering it in a way which completely bypasses all content regulation in Europe. He was asked about regulation, and all he talked about was net neutrality, which is all about a kind of delivery. He, was, he, he, he couldn't really care about content regulation because he isn't content regulated. Now, I, kinda, I just wonder what's going to happen to rules like impartiality when you've got something that looks like television, smells like television, we talk about television, but apparently isn't television. Henry? Um, I find it a very interesting discussion, but it, it seems to me that uh, this idea of being partisan is very much being partisan between um, establishments and political organisations uh, that are broadly within the same ideological framework. Um, I find very interesting what David was saying about like, silences and what isn't reported, which I find very interesting. And I think that's partly down to sourcing, which is again, who do we use, where do we get the news, we get it from establishment political parties. And you might have a you know, differentiation between various centre-right political parties and we give you the same amount of time, we give you the same amount of time, but the message is effectively the same. Certainly in Ireland, and, and I don't think there's huge ideological differences between Democrats and Republicans when you come to, to serious issues. And uh, in terms of um, the Irish crisis, we, we basically, the, the media tends to talk to economists 
the work for banks, you know, which is a, and we haven't gone beyond that. I'd be curious if, for, for today, if you would you go beyond that, beyond Jim Towers, beyond, you know, people who work for pension companies who have vested interest, uh, industries behind them. That, um, how, how would you see a commercial sector, uh, I take your point about the safe having huge influences, but on the other hand, in the print media, we get a monopoly by what's considered one of the greatest tax dodgers in the state in, in history. So, you know, if it goes both ways, how do you avoid a commercial monopoly in the same way as a I think it is, uh, it's, it's a big question, it's a big issue, and there's the media mergers, uh, I'm not even sure it's a bill yet, but the media mergers legislation the government's supposed to bring in, and, and you know, I think you, to some degree, you can control that, but it does seem funny that, that media, even that media merger uh, legislation doesn't actually consider the state as an owner, it's really only about private ownership. Um, but I think, you know, I think it is a legitimate concern around, um, the degrees of private ownership and cross-media ownership and all of that. Um, and that's not, that's not actually commenting and saying that, uh, you know, we need adequate resourcing, all of us, to, to do our jobs. And, and uh, you know, it is legitimate for people to invest in these businesses. And if that provides resourcing, then, then that's okay. I think the comment you make, and I, I'm going to risk the ire of Pork McKeown from Drury here in, in terms of that issue of, you know, not knowing what is said, and it also comes back to the issue earlier in the previous panel where we were looking at the situation in Turkey and, and your definition of, of uh, journalism as context. I always think the, the, the definition of PR, which my father told me, was it's about to tell the truth uh, and nothing but the truth. And I think that is, in many ways, the danger around a lot, uh, around a lot of broadcasting if we just strictly follow the regulation <coughs> And if you don't have, at the same time, a plurality of outlets to make sure that you do get good coverage of these stories. I'm not a journalist myself, so I can't talk enough about the sourcing. I, I, I hear what you say there. Amanda. Um, I wanted to raise an example because I think it's a useful way to tweak one of the underlying assumptions. I'm very much in agreement with you on the plurality of media. And frankly, I think it's really important to also really support um, you know, healthy democracy and like how we can give people access to media and how we can make sure that there is um, real representation. In effect, democracy is quite messy and I'd expect media these days to be <laughs> messy as well. Um, but to your point that you can obviously view and judge an editorial agenda not just by what's published but by what is omitted. And I've also seen instances in the US in which um, you know, people assume that if you are left-leaning or right-leaning, you will necessarily omit. Um, I've had some practical experience with this. So in 2008, I ran an effort called Off the Bus for the Huffington Post. And I organized, I think the eventual number was about 14,000 people to help the Huffington Post cover the election. Now, many of them were left-leaning. There were some conservatives, but frankly, they were very much in the minority. And we broke what was considered the biggest story um, during that election year. It was later, it later became known as Bittergate. And we broke several other big stories actually about um, candidates on the left. And this was very interesting to me because I didn't know if this was going to be the case going into the effort. And in fact, a lot of the early criticism was, oh, you're just going to chase after candidates on the right. You know, people thought that we would basically be a sort of witch hunt <laughs> in disguise. But what I found was that for a lot of people who um, saw this as a hobby and saw this as something interesting they do on the side, they just naturally drifted towards what interested them. But that didn't hold them back from publishing stories that they thought might hinder or frankly hurt their favorite candidate. And so I think it's really careful, uh, I think we should be careful not to assume that we know <laughs> what would necessarily emerge from changes in the media environment because we all have, um, I think we're all quite complex in our own ways and make. And that's, and I want to just jump in on that because that gets to, I think, that early, that first question, which was, you know, the, the classic conservative critique of the media culture, which is that it's unfair to conservatives because, you know, as these surveys purport to show, you know, most journalists self identify as Democrats. And I think there's one. In, in the United States, one you know, irrefutable data point is that if you look during the 1990s, you know, the most aggressive pursuers 
of Bill Clinton and his many scandals in pres in, during his, his term uh, in the White House, uh, including his uh, extramarital activities, were not necessarily the right-wing media. They were the very establishment newsrooms that the conservatives claim are propping up Democratic politicians. In Newsweek magazine, uh, the Washington Post was very aggressive. The New York Times published the first major investigation of uh, the Whitewater land scandal, which was kind of the, the, the Ur scandal, the genesis of all of the you know, scandals that would ultimately become the Monica Lewinsky sex scandal. So I think it's just, again, this idea that media exists to protect Democrats is false. It, if you just look at the record now, maybe you can find individual stories that could be biased to the left, but just this, this sort of global macro critique I find kind of simplistic and, 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 um, and not very sort of productive in terms of trying to get to a place where media is trying to represent reality as it exists. You, the, the title of your, your forthcoming book is the, the Loudest Voice in the Room. Yes. So is the, is the subtitle to that, Not So Bad After All, <laughs> in relation to Fox News. Is that what your message? Well, no, I, I, I mean, I think Fox is why it's such a compelling story, and I spent all this time reporting the book, is that it's, it's changed our culture. I mean, it, the, all of these things were swirling around, but it took um, the sort of unique genius of Roger Ailes uh, and his partnership with Rupert Murdoch to come, come and make it a reality and to, to finally fracture the media culture in a broad mainstream way so that we do have a, a partisan media now uh, in America. I mean, the, all these sort of undercurrents had existed for decades, but uh, with, you know, the commitment of Murdoch's uh, finances and Ailes' uh, genius as a programmer and uh, as, a, as a leader of, of, um, of an organization that he can move it in one direction. He, you know, they made it the reality. Now, you know, I think Fox has sort of become the loudest voice in the room in American politics because they've changed not only the media culture but the political culture. And I think one of the corrosive aspects of it uh, goes back to how campaigns, how politicians now view the media to get their message to communicate to, to voters. And I just want to do one quick example from the last presidential campaign in the United States. Um, you know, the Mitt Romney campaign took a very concerted effort to primarily speak to voters through Fox News and that, you know, up through most of the campaign, they largely excluded the major uh, American newspapers and uh, television networks from giving them access. And if, if the candidate wanted to give an interview, he would go on Fox News. And by and large, it was a friendly venue. There were a few very, you know, there were a few contentious interviews with Romney uh, that, he, that he had on Fox. But by and large, uh, Fox was a very friendly venue. Now, I would argue that's not a healthy development for democracy where candidates will only talk to one media outlet or the other. I think the media journalists do exert a very healthy function in, in democracy to, to ask questions, to probe, to challenge, to be unpredictable. And, um, and I think one of the biggest political changes in America has been that Fox has become, in many ways, the, the, the preferred choice of the Republican Party. Uh, to the detriment of talking to any other major media outlets. Um, and you know, that has a political consequence. Amanda, final word? OK, I'll be very quick. And would add to that that um, campaigns in the US, um, given what regulation we do and don't have, <laughs> um, also spend a lot on creating their own media. And you can look at campaigns that now have extraordinary publishing power. You know, They could, for example, in the case of the Obama campaign, send email to upwards of 30 million people. Now, what publication, right, would have the reach for a story they're writing about the campaign's news that day that the campaign effect had? So I would say that the dynamic is even that much more complex because media is now the province of the campaigns, the politicians, outlets, and the people. Okay. Uh, we're going to leave it there. We're, we're up against time. Uh, that was a fascinating session, and, and thank you to the three speakers. Um, we will reconvene at 2 o'clock, those that are watching online. We'll be back with Peter Horrocks uh, of the BBC with uh, the second keynote of today's uh, conference. So can we say thank you to our speakers, please? <laughs> <laughs>